Well, friends, let's go ahead and get started, even as others continue to join us in this conversation. My name is Lisa Zook. I serve as the Vice President of Strategic Initiatives of Chicago Theological Seminary, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this gathering today. Um, first of all, I want to remind you that um, when you came into this meeting, you were automatically muted. Um, if you can please keep yourself on mute, unless you're making a comment, that would be great. Um, just helps to ensure we don't have background noise that interferes with the people who are speaking. Um, there will be time during our conversation today for comments and questions. Um, and when we get to that point, you can either drop questions in the chat or comments in the chat, or you can also raise your hand and then unmute yourself to speak. So, um, and at that point, remember that you're muted, so you have to unmute to speak. Um, and um, also want to let you all know that um, we do record these uh, Wednesday gatherings. They're available after the fact off our website. Um, but the fact of your being here um, counts as your consent to be part of this recording. Um, before we get started this morning, I would like to acknowledge that Chicago Theological Seminary resides on the traditional territories of the three fire peoples, the Ojibwa, Odawa, and Badawadmi, purchased after two and a half years of open warfare, decades of violent encroachment, and the defeat of a pan-Indian movement to keep settlers out of the Great Lakes region at the Treaty of Chicago in 1821. The area was also a site of trade, gathering, and healing for more than a dozen other native tribes. We recognize that indigenous peoples are the traditional stewards of the land that we now occupy living here long before Chicago was a city and still thriving here today. As we work, live, and play on these territories, we must ask what we can do to right the historic wrongs of colonization and state violence and support indigenous communities' struggles for self-determination and sovereignty. For those of you not in Chicago, if you know the names of the indigenous peoples who originally lived on your land, I encourage you to add those names and locations to the chat as we all commit to this work together. Those of you who have been regular participants in these Wednesday gatherings will remember CTS and Bayonne student Diego LeBlond. Diego was a frequent participant in this forum <clears throat> with a contagious smile and a welcoming presence. He often shared inquisitive comments through the chat or by engaging our speakers. Our time together was enriched by his presence. Tragically, Diego passed from this life to the next last Saturday evening. And today we grieve his passing and remember his life. I ask that you all please join me in a moment of silence for Diego, our friend. For it is from God we come, and to God we shall return. Amen. Today, it is my pleasure to welcome Reverend Dr. Susan Thistlethwaite to offer our words of gathering this morning. Professor of Theology Emerita and President Emerita of CTS, Susan's influence and leadership continues to help steer CTS into the future. A prolific author with 13 academic books to her name, she has also ventured into the realm of fiction. I commend to you her mystery novels, which have a way of shedding light on some of the most pressing social issues of our time. She has also written for the Washington Post, the Huffington Post, and currently has a column in her local newspaper. I could say so much more about Susan, I was privileged to study with her, to travel to Palestine and Israel with her. 
but perhaps above all, I am blessed to call her my friend. Susan, welcome. Thank you, Lisa. And uh, thank you, Kim, for asking me to offer these words. Um, I have been given to understand that I need to, I would face location. And I, I locate myself as a Christian liberation theologian, uh, which to me means always uh, the interrelationship of our faiths and activism. And I have uh, later a poem to share, but uh, I thought I would share a little minute of what I am currently working on. Uh, I'm giving a speech at the Council on Foreign Relations next week on faith perspectives on the future of nuclear weapons. And I have been an activist, peace activist, my whole adult life. Um, the Vietnam War told, taught me that. And um, it may not have occurred to you that the most widely shared across the faith traditions, faith commitment, is the opposition to nuclear weapons that it is horrific, immoral, an insult to the creator to target, let alone destroy, what God has created. And my argument to the Council on Foreign Relations will be anyone who predicts the future is an idiot. <laughs> so that is not uh, uh, something that I think we are wise to take on. We know what our commitments are, and we know our commitment is to the planet as God's creation. And so it has been my joy over so many decades to work in interfaith communities. And if you're interested, you can read about this in Interfaith Just Peacemaking and the point about the shared interfaith commitment to the opposition of nuclear weapons um, is in chapter on on uh, weapons. Uh, but this morning's New York Times um, made me think of sharing that with you because there is an article about Russian generals discussing the use of tactical nuclear weapons uh, as they grow in frustration and of course in incompetence uh, in the war in Ukraine. So this is very important and timely. But what I have to share for you uh, is a poem. This is from Adrian Rich, certainly one of my favorite po poets. And given our speaker, um, I thought this poem spoke to being here together and the topic. One of the great functions of art is to help us imagine what it is like to be not ourselves. What it is like to be someone or something else. What it is like to live in another skin. What it is like to live in another body. And in that sense, to surpass ourselves, to go out beyond ourselves. Thanks. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> that was lovely. Um, friends, our featured speaker today is an amazing human being. Sarvan Hagigi is an artist and also an executive for a global nonprofit organization. But first and foremost, she is an Iranian woman. A Chicago resident since 2013, Sarvan pays homage to tradition, embracing her childhood nostalgia, nostalgia while providing cultural commentary on a woman's experience in the contemporary Middle East. She transcends the visual and incorporates the written word in her compositions, particularly the poetry of 13th century Persian poet and Sufi mystic Rumi. The confluence of painting, poetry, and callig calligraphy bestows an homage to tradition in our frantic modern world. 
Those of you who were part of the CTS community in 2018 will remember Sarvan as our featured artist as our at our Beloved is a Verb Riot Con conference. In fact, if you have visited my office at CTS, you've seen a piece of the art that Sarvan created that day hanging on my wall. She was situated in, our, in the small chapel on our first floor, and we covered the walls and the floors with these big sheets of, I don't even know, board, white board, and using calligraphy, she painted the word love in Farsi again and again and again. And folks were invited to come and sit and meditate and watch her. And it was beautiful and stunning. Um, and I appreciate that piece of art in my office. And Sarvan, I think of you every time I look at it, which is, which is wonderful. Sarvan has remained a friend of CTS, and I am delighted to welcome her today as we share in conversation about the tragic events that are unfolding in Iran. Sarvan, it's so good to see you, my friend. Welcome. Thank you so much, Lisa and Suzanne and everybody who are here. Uh, it is my honor to be here. And as I said earlier, CTS has a very, very special and dear place in my heart. Um, so it is, it is a pleasure to be here and thank you for being here to every single one of you. I know some of you are working, um, so it is, it is very much appreciated. Thank you. Um, I really don't want to talk about myself because I think this moment is really important that we, we are very clear what's happening and what can we do collectively, Iranian and non-Iranian. Um, I hope by now uh, you know what's happening in Iran, but I'm just gonna give a little bit of a um, background and please forgive me if my voice starts shaking or, or I, I might even break into tears. Uh, we are all going through collective trauma. Uh, so I appreciate your understanding. Um, I will try to hold it together as much as I can. Um, so um, the only, I think the only proper way that we can understand what's happening and what the, what the message is that people in Iran want um, at the moment is how this revolution started. Um, it all started after the death of uh, a 22 year old woman, Kurdish woman named Massa Gina Amini. Um, Kurd or Kurdish people are an Iranian ethnic group um, native to the mountainous part of um, Kurdistan in Western Asia. Um, and they've always been targeted by Islamic Republic. Um, and if you've ever met a, met a court, they're the nicest, courageous uh, people that you will ever meet. Um, she was taken into custody um, as she was visiting Tehran with her brother and her family. Uh, she was taken from the metro station. She was taken into custody. And within a few hours, she was, um, she was dead. Um, eyewitnesses say, that she was brain dead because she was beaten heavily with a heavy object. Um, and this is not the first and definitely not the last uh, that it's been happening. This has been going on for years and years. Uh, but what came next was the mass protest that evolved into revolution. And it was kind of the last strike for people, especially for women. Uh, we really, I think women in Iran really had enough. Um, as you see, I'm sure you've seen videos of women uh, cutting their hair and burning their scarves in the streets of Iran. This is beyond courageous. Uh, I cannot even tell you how scary this morality police are. Um, they, have, they have no humanity whatsoever. Um, so it is a brave and courageous act to ask for their freedom in, their, in this way. And um, that's why I think everybody's saying this, this revolution is led by women, but let's not forget that everybody continued and started to share um, stories and, and uh, it, this revolution basically grew to include all walks of life, men and women um, in every city of Iran from every ethnicity uh, and every class. Um, we've seen even images of men um, protecting women, uh, trying to stand in, in front of women, protecting them from bullets. So um, it is really an act of bravery from 
people of Iran. I cannot tell you, like the videos that we're seeing, I'm sure it speaks for it on its own. Um, sorry. <laughs> As I said, there are so many stories that's coming out that you see um, even children are, are in the streets and trying to um, you know, protest with their parents. And for, the, for that reason, there have been a lot of children killed as well, um, as young as two years old, uh, if you can believe it. Um, for me, the most powerful images are when um, students holding hands in universities and schools, uh, chanting woman life freedom. Now that slogan comes from uh, a Kurdish, uh, it's a Kurdish slogan basically. And in Farsi, in Kurdish, it's pronounced Jen Jian Azadi, um, which kind of translates into woman life freedom. And I'm sure you've heard of that. So that's kind of the slogan of this uh, revolution in respect to Massa uh, Jina Amini. Um, we are all, it's important, and I'll get in more details in it, but um, it's really important to mention that this is not only about hijab. This is not us saying we don't wanna wear hijab. Uh, we are saying we want freedom. We want our basic human rights. We, are, we, we don't mind if somebody wants to wear their hijab. If this is the freedom of choice, obviously. And everybody, everybody respects that. So that's kind of, that has been said from a lot of news outlets. I just wanted to cl clarify that because um, unfortunately, um, as the internet are cut off in Iran uh, by this regime, um, some people are able to send news and information out accessing with VPN, but it's really hard to get news out, uh, unfortunately, from Iran. So it's, it's up to Iranians outside of Iran to just share these stories and we contact our friends as much as we can and try to still keep this movement going outside their you know, in parallel, just to give them hope and show them that the world is watching and we are hearing them, we're standing with them. Um, we really try to hold all these new outlets accountable in the way that they're spreading the news as well. Some of them are, it's really disappointing to see um, major news outlets um, titling this revolution as it's because of economical crisis or it's because we don't want to wear hijab. These are not true. And it's, it's really sad to see. Uh, we just are fighting for our freedom, basic, basic human rights and have a choice, which has been taken away from us since this regime has come into power since uh, 1979. Um, so from us, from our part, we're just trying to for every, every post that we do, we try to tag as many as news outlets as we can, try to get the word out, um, just to make sure that we do not, we're not asking for policy reform. This time is different. We just want regime change. There is no room for policy reform at all. Uh, I cannot emphasize that enough. Um, and as Iranians outside of Iran, uh, I personally believe we don't have, we don't have the right to tell what Iranian people want, but clearly we know that this is one of them as we speak with them frequently uh, every day. Um, so as, as I said, uh, you've heard the slogan, woman life freedom. So basically that comes, it's, it's in it. It's, um, it says it all basically. Since 1979, uh, women have been taken most of the rights. It's been taken away by this, by this monstrous, ruthless regime um, in every aspect of life. We cannot, we cannot sit together and, and work places in public workplaces with men. Um, classes are separated, even schools are separate, separated. Um, at the, in the buses, women are sitting in the back, separated from women, uh, separated from men, sorry. Um, we cannot get any major positions in, uh, you know, in, in office, we can't make any, um, Decisions in you know major political uh, positions, women are not women are not able to do that unfortunately. Um, I remember growing up when I used to go skiing. Uh, there was a rope in between this slope, and men and women are separated. And God help you if you if you dared cross that line, you would be really brutally entreated. Um, so you know really really small things that makes a huge difference. We didn't have all those rights. Um, in addition to that, uh, they have taken this, the safety and security, even from our own homes. If we had gatherings, 
there was any minute for possibility of them and this police coming to her home and take everybody uh, to prison, get money. And that, it's, it's so corrupt that usually with money, if you're lucky, you can pay your way out. But if you're unlucky like Massa, uh, you know, the worst can happen to you, obviously. Um, my generation, I was born um, on the year of revolution. So my ger generation growing up, um, I can tell you with certainty that all of us <laughs> have um, experienced being prisoned uh, at least for a few hours. Um, some of us tortured. Uh, I was the lucky one. I was only jailed for a few hours, um, which is still traumatic. Obviously, I'm still trying to <laughs> Uh, process that. Um, these are all traumas that were never resolved for us. Um, now, uh, with all this, uh, with the revolution that's happening, and I really, I'm here asking you to, whenever you're talking about it, this is not a protest, it's not an uprising, it is a revolution. Uh, we need to give credit to this amazing, brave people of Iran and really, really make sure that we are um, standing with them in the right way. Um, the Islamic Republic. And again, I don't want to say Islamic Republic of Iran because I don't, I really don't think they belong to Iran. Uh, so I always say Islamic Republic or I call them the regime. Um, they've been violently cracking down um, men and women in my country. Uh, I'm sure you've heard a lot of horror stories. Uh, we sing them every day, but um, the death tolls are rising. Um, the numbers we can't really say for sure because there's so many people who do not access to social media. Uh, they're very, they're not really, they don't have many families, they're in villages, so we don't know. But from what we know, it's around 300 people who've been killed so far. Uh, 36 are children. Um, school girls are being abducted from school. Uh, whereabouts are unknown. And few of them who were able to make one phone call to their parents uh, were able to only ask for abortion pills. So just let that sink in. Um, sorry. <laughs> This always gets me. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, yes, yeah, so a lot of them, um, we really don't know what's happening with them. A lot of them are being tortured. There was this girl, there are so many stories and I don't wanna uh, waste your time on it, but there's this one uh, that is uh, really going around. Her name is Armita Abbasi and she's, she's, she's a young woman. She was abducted. And she was only seen um, at a hospital that this, monsters just took her to get immediate care because she was raped so badly multiple times that she was bleeding so badly that she needed immediate care. But once she got there, um, her family got, got the note of it. And before they arrived, they took her away without, without her being treated. And we still have no idea where she is. Um, we, we've been all trying to contact UN human rights. And it's so frustrating to see how quiet they are. And I always say they're silent, they're silent is so loud. Um, it is really, really frustrating for all of us. We, we are trying every day um, just to, for them to stand with us and do something. Um, but so far, we haven't been successful, but that doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to stop. We're definitely gonna keep it going. Uh, as I said, one of the many reasons that we want the regime change and we don't wanna reform is the matter that there's no justice. Um, the judiciary system is so corrupt and the head of the, the system is a part of a terrorist, uh, as clear as it sounds. Um, and we, as I said, we, we just want regime change. Um, now, again, I need to be clear, when, when I say regime change, we do not want the outside community, the, the, you know, like the world leaders to come and um, make the regime change for us. That's not what we want. We do not want any military, uh, you know, we, don't, we do not want any war any, for any sort of matter. We just have few steps that we are asking, and I will we'll talk about it in a bit, uh, that are, I think it's easy for all of us to do. It will take only five minutes, honestly, out of everybody's time, and I hope it will be effective. Because I think um, it's up to women of, women and men in Iran to decide their, their own future. Uh, they are fighting for their freedom. Um, and the world leaders have the power to remove this regime out of power. Uh, so that, that's what we're trying to do. Um, 
And then, oh, another thing that I wanted to say, any news that's coming, coming out from Iran's uh, news outlets, uh, do not trust them. Because obviously they are just providing, they're just trying to feed uh, their own story, their organization story, which is absolutely not true. Uh, so always just take a few um, people that you trust uh, within your community and ask, ask if you want to know more, always you can ask about, if you can always have uh, me, I'm not, I'm not, a, um, I'm not really a political <laughs> expert uh, and I'm not affiliated with any group, but I have friends and I'm trying to get the news out as much as possible. And I try to translate it to English so that it's easier for non-Iranian speakers just to understand what's happening. Um, but I'm sure everybody has a lot of, a lot of Iranian people uh, in their community. So please just ask around because it makes a difference. Um, if you don't mind, I'm gonna just quickly say what we, what we kind of are, are asking our um, representatives and elected officials. And I'll tell you how you can help. Uh, we want them to seize all trade deals for no ne negotiations with the Islamic Republic. Advocate all political prisoners including activists, artists, university students to be free. These prisoners are subject to extreme tortures. And some of them we just heard during last week that they're going to um, execute them. So these are the, these are the, tax, these are the um, fear tactics that we've seen this regime do and they're continuing to do it. We want all their uh, government officials, even the, the Islamic Republic government officials and their diplomats to be expelled from all the countries around the world and freeze their assets, the asset that belongs to the Iranian people that they stole during all this 43 years. Um, and believe it or not, uh, Islamic Republic uh, is a member of the UN Women Commission. Um, yeah, let that sink in as well. Um, now, th thanks, thanks to all the efforts of everybody amplifying the voices of people in Iran, uh, there has been a post from Michelle Obama, uh, along with other uh, women leaders, that they are trying to get this to the, to the UN, which is amazing. There is a petition, and I'm happy to share that with you as well, so, so we can find that. Um, so th these are like the basic things that we are asking, and it's not difficult for world leaders to do. Um, and as long as we think, as long as the international community is focused on what's happening in Iran, and it's kind of holding uh, the, this regime accountable, they know they're being watched. So we are hoping that at least there is a little bit of hope that they, there will be a, a stop to these torches and to, to all this uh, brutality that they're, they're uh, providing and um, it's happening in the country. Um, sorry, I just kind of hold my breath for a minute. It's just really uh, upsetting. One thing, and I wanted to say um, that it's, you can see now, uh, all of us Iranians around the world, uh, inside and outside, we're going through an emotional roller coaster. We're glued to our phones <laughs> for the past weeks, and we're sleep deprived. Uh, we're anxiously following the news, uh, trying to get news from our friends. Um, and it's just, it ends up for us going through all sorts of emotions, sometimes all at the same time which is really, really, uh, it's really frustrating. And I hope nobody has to go through that. Um, watching all these events that are happening in Iran also unleash, is unleashing a lot of unresolved trauma, as I said, for many of us. Um, and that's why I think we are so passionate. We, we, we've seen it, we felt it, but I'm thinking for myself, I did not have the courage that this new generation has. And it's so, inspiring just to see that they, they are saying enough is enough. We don't want this. We don't want this for us, for our children, or for anybody else in the world. Um, we will continue this revolution and we need your help to honor every bloodshed, every single of our fallen heroes uh, for freedom, for Iran and for the world. Um, we, with your help, we can turn the dream of having a basic human right to Iran into reality. And they can make Iran to become a symbol of freedom for all women and all people around the world. And as we say, Zan Zendegi Ozadi, which is woman, life, freedom. And if, if I may, I wanna end, um, I'll share the website, but I wanna end with 
a poem that I, is very dear to my heart from Sadi, Sadi Shirazi, uh, also from 13th century. And I think it's very, uh, it makes sense to say it here. If you don't mind, I'm going to recite it in Farsi first and then um, translation in English. Bani Adam Azai Yekti Garand, Kedar Afarinesh Zuyek Boharam. چو عضوی به درد آورد روزگار دگر عضوها را نماند خبر تو که از مهنت دیگران بی غمی نشاید که نامت مند آدم and it, I, I have to read the translation and it's roughly translated um, human beings are members of a whole in the creation of one essence in soul if one member is aff afflicted with pain other members uneasy will remain if you have no sympathy for human pain, the name of human you cannot retain. Thank you so much. I will uh, share this website and I'm asking you with the midterm elections already started, please, please contact your officials and your local representatives. There, is a, there are a few buttons. Honestly, it would take five minutes of your time. You can copy and paste the open letter change the wording to you as, as you like as well, and send it to President Biden, uh, White House, and Bureau of Presidents. It will make a difference. Our voices are being heard, and we need them. We need them to know that we're asking them as our representatives to stand to beat human rights. We need them to protect human rights because you can't pick and choose when it comes to human rights. We all deserve. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Sarvan. And that poem was absolutely beautiful um, and, and quite perfect, really. Um, friends, we have time now to engage with Sarvan to ask questions, um, clarifications. Um, I'll open it up. You can put questions in the chat um, or you can raise your hand and we can call on you and you can unmute yourself. Um, but would would love to engage further with Sarvan while she's here with us today. Kim Schultz, I see you raising your real hand. Yes, I always forget I have a fake hand too. Um, Sarvan, thank you so much. So powerful. Um, and your emotion and honesty and authenticity and person is so welcome in this space. And we're so grateful for you and your voice and, and sharing what we can do. Um, and what we should be doing. So thank you. Um, and we'll make sure we share that website as well. Um, I just would love to hear, and I know you touched on it. I know you said communication is obviously hard coming out of Iran, but what, if there anything else specifically you are hearing on the ground um, through your, your specific networks, is, is there anything else that, um, that you're just hearing on, on the ground more than, than we're getting in the press that you can share with us? Thank you, Kim. Um, first of all, I shared the website on the chat already. Uh, it's called Free Run, Free, Free World. So feel free to save that somewhere. Um, and yeah, so uh, I, I, we are all in touch with our own friends and family as much as we can. They, they cannot um, access the internet every day. But, and there are some um, reliable sources on Instagram and Twitter that we follow. Um, not all of them are. There are, it's, you have to be very careful who you're listening to because there's so many news coming out. Some of them are fake. Some of them are fed by this regime just to um, get hope out of us, uh, make us hopeless. Uh, that's been seen uh, throughout the years. Thankfully, I think this time, people in Iran are so smart. They know all the tricks and they are calling them out as soon as it happens, which is really amazing to see. I think this generation, uh, they cannot fool them this time. Uh, they know all of the tricks. They grew up with it. Um, they're really, really um, educated about it. When you see uh, this new generation talk in, in news outlets, in BBC or CNN, it's inspiring to see how educated they are. Um, they know more than I do. It's, it's empowering. It's really empowering. Uh, what we hear is that uh, from, from the locals, and we see those videos as well, like people... At a certain time at night, they go up to the roof, they stomp their feet, and they they start yelling, they start chanting "Woman, life, freedom" in Farsi or "Down with the dictator," which is still very blatant, because they they are now sending troops um, with snipers 
uh, beneath these buildings just to shoot down everybody that they see. So there, there is no, there is no humanity when it comes to these guys. They are trying to uh, put fear into people's hearts, and people, and I think people are so brave, so courageous, so determined this time that we do not want this. We can't take it any longer, and we want you removed as soon as possible. So the only thing they're asking us is to get help from our representatives so that they they bring this to house floor in U.S as well as other countries around the world. We've seen European Parliament is doing amazing so far. They've been so supportive. Um, Canada has been also uh, done, taken a few major steps. So I think our voices are being heard. Um, we are being so loud that our hope is they can't stay indifferent. Uh, that's what we're doing. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> I see in the chat that, um, oh, Kim, is that you? Um, yeah, who to follow? Yeah, if you have okay. any questions. Um, but you can share again, that with Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. It's, it's, again, it's sometimes it's personal. I will put down some names that I personally um, follow on Instagram. Um, and I can even email them. I don't know what would be easier, Lisa. Will it be easier if I email them to you and then you can share with everybody? OK, let's do that. So I'll, I'll put a list together for Instagram and Twitter. Um, and I'll share that with everybody after the meeting. I'll share it with Lisa and she can email you if that's okay. Thanks, Sarvan. Other questions, comments, thoughts? Any question is welcome. So please feel free to ask. Yeah, Susan. Uh, Sarvan, could you describe for us uh, what you feel um, would be a possible outcome in terms of the revolution and the regime change? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Susan. Uh, again, I'm not. I'm not. Um, political experts. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to get this message across. But our hope is, um, our hope is for this regime to be removed. And when we say we want their diplomats to be expelled and their assets frozen, they are everywhere. They are in Chicago even. They're in every city that you can imagine. They have roots and they have, they're running companies, they're laundering money. We want these to be stopped. And that's part of the revolution. And my, our hope, I think, is once these guys are gone and they're taken off power, Iranian people can have their own uh, state or their own rules. Again, I'm outside of Iran. I don't think I have the right to say what they want. Right. I know what they want kind of makes sense. Uh, they basically now just want their freedom. We haven't had a, a one leader or of some sort that has you know, stated publicly what the rules are going to be. And I think that might be actually in our benefit because yeah. now this is being led by, you know, groups of people collectively. And I think it, that's why it's making it so powerful. So I can't really answer your question in terms of exactly what it's going to look like. But I, our hope is when these guys are removed, uh, we will have the freedom to decide people of in Iran has it more freedom to decide what their future is going to be, but definitely with basic human rights involved. Thanks. John, I see you have your hand up. Khili uh, Mamnoon, Khili Multishakaram, Sarveen. So I've been watching this story, of course, a lot too. I'm, I'm, I, I've studied Persian, so it, it's, it's, it's a, I can see that. A culture I, I'm very interested in too. And uh, I, one of the things that strikes me is that there seems to be momentum here. Uh, this has been, what, more than 40 days. Yes. And, but I was hoping you have more insight than I do. Uh, what, because of course, the, this is, has not been the first protest against the Khamenei regime. Um, 
do you think it is different this time? Do you think there is more momentum on this this time? Do you think it will be different this time than say the green movement or the protests against uh, gas prices a few years back? Thank you for your question and thank you for your fast. Your fast is amazing. Uh, it's really amazing to see. Um, I, I really think this time is different because the previous times people were open to have kind of a reformed um, regime. This time, collectively, everybody's saying we do not want, we don't want to have anything to do with you guys. We want you to remove our power and we want you out of our country. We want you to give our country back. This is literally what, what people in Iran are saying. Um, and I think these crackdowns and uh, tortures and I'm hoping the executions are just, they're trying to um, uh, make people be afraid a little bit, and I really, really hope they won't do it. But anything is possible uh, with this when it comes to this monstrous regime. Um, I think they're digging the hole even deeper, uh, if that makes sense. It's uh, people are angry. People are really done this time. And as I said, they, if you say reform, they will they will really stop you right there. So that's that's not what we want. We do not want to reform. I think this is why it's different. And it's the fact that it's being led by the new generation, the young generation, and it's grassroots. I think it's, uh, I think it's definitely different. It feels different for me. It feels different for a lot of us. A lot of, a lot of the Iranians in diaspora, we draw the sand, we draw the line on the sand. When we started to uh, you know, share the news and publicly, um, Say down with the dictator, down with Khamenei, and publicly also join forces with the people in Iran. We draw the line in the sand. If these guys stay in Iran for any reason, I hope that they doesn't come. But if they stay, people like me, we can never go back, um, or we will be definitely arrested in, in the airport and probably be executed. Um, so I think I think that's why I I see the difference that millions of us outside of Iran. You saw what happened in Berlin. Uh, thousands of people came together. I think that was kind of one of the biggest, um, you know, protests that happened outside of Iran. Um, I really feel this is different. And I, I'm really hoping we can keep the momentum going. We will. Um, but I really hope with, with the help of all of you here and all of my non-Iranian community, we can, we can really make a change and help uh, bring freedom and basic human rights to Iran. If I could follow up on that. Um, from what I've studied of Iranian history, I, I, I've seen that a lot of the big changes and revolutions that have occurred in Iran have often occurred. There's been the, the liberal reformers, there's been the bazaris, and I've been reading uh, through Juan Cole, uh, a, a University of Michigan professor who does a wonderful blog, that there have been um, good stories out that there have been businessmen, bazaris, who have been uh, closing their shops, uh, and so, which I think is a positive sign. Uh, but also, uh, often there's been uh, an element of the ulama, of the, the Shiite religious establishment who has stepped in, whether in the, uh, the tobacco protest in the, the late 19th century or the constitutional revolution. Is there any sign that, because of course, not all of, not every Ayatollah or uh, every member, every Shiite clergyman is a supporter of Khamenei. Is there any uh, indication that there are any uh, Shiite uh, clergymen who are taking part in these protests? Yes, um, I can uh, answer that a little bit. Again, I'm not as educated as you are about politics. Um, these are just based on, I, I don't, declare myself as an expert. But um, as you said, like a lot of, lot of Bazari people, a lot of guys with Tehran Bazar, it has been very influential in 1979 revolution for those of you who don't know. So if those guys join forces with Iranian people on the streets, then that's basically a huge, huge step forward. Uh, for the past few weeks, um, we've seen that happening uh, every now and then. And a lot of Petrochemical workers have joined these strikes as well, with with huge crackdowns from the government and huge um, threats. They've been threatened. Uh, these are the people that are 
uh, below poverty line, so they they need the money to work, but they decided that they want to stand with their pe- with their people in solidarity, and they want to they want to join this movement, which is which is very powerful to me. Because um, as you know, there the hard part is there is there is not much way for us to even send them financial uh, assistance because of the sanctions put on Iran uh, in the first place, and that's that's another thing. These sanctions. Uh, put by U.S. Um, on Iran is direct is affecting normal day-to-day people, not the government. Um, and this is another thing. So for that, if you see any donation going around for money, please do not do it unless you know that somebody is taking money with hand to Iran. Because a lot of these, unfortunately, we don't know where the money is going. Legally, you cannot send any money to Iran. Um, so you know, we are trying with a with our close networks just to try and give money to these people because we know how important they are, how, how important they are to our revolution. Uh, so by feeding their families and helping sure that they, they survive, I think that's important. I am hoping if everybody see that happening, uh, that might be also a positive um, you know, part to show them that there is a support if you don't go to work for a week but if you stand in solidarity with people, but we are seeing it happen slowly by slowly. As I said, the news is really hard to come out, especially with the petrochemical workers, because a lot of these people don't have access to social media. So by the time they go on strike and the news gets out, it's a little bit of a delay, but we do hear it. Um, And whenever we hear, we just try to share this information and we kind of try to um, let them know how empowering this is. but you're right. Um, once once they join, as history shows, uh, that would definitely be the end of it. I'm I'm hoping that I didn't go off rails when I answered your question. That's I tend to do that because I haven't slept. <laughs> Excellent answer. Thank you so much. Thank you for your question. So everyone, there's a comment in in the chat. Um, from Shiva. Um, oh talking- yeah, I know Shiva. Hi Shiva. <laughs> um, but she's really talking about the need to get Western leaders um, to support the people of Iran and to put pressure um, on the government for change. And you had mentioned the protests in Berlin. And I'm just wondering, you know, is there a way or how can we here, especially those of us who live in like a large city like Chicago, how can we help people who are organizing on the ground um, to be doing things? I saw in Times Square the other day, they had the Women Life Freedom up as a big banner, right? So getting more and more people to become aware to then pressure our leaders or whatever. Um, but are there organizations on the ground here in Chicago and other places that we can also support? Um, and those might be places that donations would be helpful, for example, um, but as well as like our time and our energies. Thank you for that. Uh, excellent question. Um, yes, I will make sure to include in my email that I'll send you as well, uh, the, the reliable organization that does global protests. So what, what happens is uh, in Chicago, we do have a group and it's all again, grassroots. It's not, uh, I think they just actually, um, Became a uh, became a non nonprofit, but I'm I'm part of that group as well. So it's just a bunch of us trying to uh, organize, you know, protests and raise awareness. We just had our event um, last week uh, at Buckingham uh, Fountain, and the, we made a human chain. Uh, and I think we had around, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, I have to let you know that there's not a big of Iranian community here in Chicago. It's not like LA or Toronto but we had around uh, 1,100 people, if I'm not wrong, mm-hmm. um, which was great to see. Like Iranians, non-Iranians came together. Uh, I'll make sure to mention them uh, in my email. It's called Chicago for Iran, for with number. Um, and they are doing a lot of, lot of great work. Um, again, they're not affiliated with anything, any group, uh, just trying to help people in Iran. Uh, we just had a meeting last night. Uh, I, I was telling Lisa till 11.30 at night, just trying to brainstorm and see what we can do for this. They just released seven names that they're gonna execute. Um, we were just trying to see how we can raise awareness, how we can stop that. Because even if, if we can stop one person, uh, if we can save even one life, 
I think we've, we've done our job. We might not be able to unfortunately save everybody, but uh, we need to talk about them. We need to put uh, faces to these names. I think we need to, we need to really do that. Um, and we have, we have some ideas. So I'm hoping I'll let, I'll make sure that I'll share that with you as soon as we have something going on. Um, and I'll make sure I'll have that on the email as well. But thank you. Yeah, there's definitely more to do. President Braxton. Thank you. <laughs> Sarvan, first I want to, on behalf of the entire CTS community, let you know how deeply you have moved my heart and our hearts. I always believe that provocation in the best sense of that word is the ultimate function of teaching. And you have been an extraordinarily compelling teacher today. And I just want to say on behalf of all of my siblings on this call, we don't ever want you to apologize for the tenderness of your heart and the steely resolve we feel in your spirit. And the one question that I wanted to just ask you is, as you have so poignantly described the grotesquery and the horror, where is your hope coming from right now? What is keeping you personally moving forward? I would like to know that, and I know many of us on this call might want to know that, just so we can connect our energy to that energy that may be giving you hope. What are your sources and reservoirs of hope right now? First of all, thank you. As you can see, I'm I'm unworthy of your beautiful and kind comments, but I'm very honored and very touched. Thank you so much. Um, I, I strongly believe uh, hope is our strongest weapon. And that's what's scaring this government. Um, they are trying to feed fear. We've seen throughout history, not only in Iran, but any, any revolution, any point, I mean, put your finger on any revolution that you can. Hope, I think, was the main thing that kind of you know, made history at the end of the day. Uh, people who are in prison, uh, there is few of them. And I have to mention that Evin Prison, which is a notorious prison in Tehran, holds uh, our most beloved uh, professors, artists, activists. So we, we don't call it Evin Prison, we call it University Evin, because it's, it's filled with, honestly, mm. the most educated people we have. Um, and, you know, these people, if they can, and they have since before they were arrested or if they get a chance to come, uh, come, come out or call their family, that's the message you're sending. They're saying, we have hope. If they have hope being tortured, and I can't tell you how awfully they're being tortured uh, every day, and they still have hope, I really don't think I have even, I, I don't give myself the right to even lose that for one second. I need to keep going. I need to keep going for, for in, in their honor, in the honor of the lives that lost. I, I, have, I have moments that I feel hopeless. I'm human, so I, I definitely, the images that I see, the videos that I see, uh, there are times we all go up and down, but at the end of the day, I just keep reminding myself that I'm doing this for the next, next generation, because I don't want them to go through what we all did. Um, and I, th I think that's what makes it so powerful. This young generation is so inspiring, uh, beyond what the images that are coming out from Iran of this young generation, just how they're bravely, creatively standing right in front of this bullet. That's, to me, sitting here talking with you guys, really, I have no right not to be hopeful. I have to stay hopeful. Thank you, President Braxton, for that question. And thank you, Sarvan, for that answer. Um, I think perhaps that's the perfect place for us to end our discussion today as we're coming up on the hour. Um, I note that Dr. Terrell dropped in the chat that the quote of today is, hope is our strongest weapon. Um, something for all of us to hold on to. Um, so, uh, friends, the website is in the chat. Kim just put it there again, so it's close to the bottom. Um, but in the coming days, I will send an email out. It will include a link to this conversation 
um, as well as the resources that Sarvan shares with me. So give us a couple of days because it takes a little bit of time to get the, the link to the video. Um, but then I'll encourage you know you all to share that widely with friends, with others in the community, um, so that we can indeed be forces um, for that hope, that growing hope, um, and and making a difference in what's going on. Sarvan, this was this was wonderful. Um, as President Braxton said, you came and you were our teacher, um, our provocateur, perhaps. Um, a call to action for all of us today. Um, I know this is hard for you to talk about, so we really appreciate your being here and bringing your full self to this. Um, and and <coughs> on behalf of folks in this in this call who I see nodding and putting affirmations up, um, we commit to join you in this cause. Um, so so you have another thirty people. Um, and if each one of us reaches another 30 people, that's how these things happen. So, yeah. So thank I you. Thank you. I thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, everybody who is here and my BTS community, which I dearly love. I can't thank you enough. This, this has been honestly so helpful. I want you to know how, how much this means to all of us. Um, I told my friends about this conversation in Iran and they were super excited. So I want you to know that they are also very grateful. Thank you. Friends, I just have a couple of announcements before we close our time together. Um, our next Wednesday gathering is taking place on Wednesday, the 16th of November. It will be an in-person gathering at CTS on site, and we will be participating in some restorative yoga. So if you're in Chicago, and oh, I saw Dr. Terrell's face get excited for that one. Um, if you're in Chicago, please join us at noon on the 16th, restorative yoga. If you've done yoga a lot or never done it before, you're welcome. And we'll follow that with community lunch. Um, our- If you have a mat, bring it. If you don't, that's fine. But if you have a mat, bring it. If you have two, bring them in case someone else doesn't have one. Um, our next virtual gathering will be the first Wednesday in December, which is December 7th. On that day, we'll be welcoming uh, Carter Hayward, author of the new book, The Seven Deadly Sins of Christian Nationalism. And Carter will be in conversation with Reverend Dr. Susan Thistlethwaite. So Susan, we're looking forward to welcoming you back on that date. Um, and one other event coming up for those of you who are in the Chicagoland area next week at 7 p.m. on the 10th of November, we are welcoming uh, Reza Aslan um, to a book event, and that will be held at the Naperville First Congregational Church. And you can find details about all of these events on the CTS website on our events page. Um, so it's always a pleasure to gather with all of you. I wish everyone peace and blessings for the journey. And again, Susan and Sarvan, thank you for being here with us today and helping to lead this time. Go in peace, friends. <laughs>